Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Fresh Vision Church. I understand that for many of you, time is valuable, and I am sincerely grateful that you've chosen to invest a portion of it by watching or listening to this message. My prayer is that the blessings you'll receive in return for that investment will be far more valuable to you. If it has, please let us know by sending us a message on one of our social media pages, whether it be on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or on SoundCloud. Now, if you're watching this on our YouTube channel, I hope that you'll bless us with an encouraging comment and also by just taking a second to click on the like and subscribe buttons. Now, in our continued effort to help lower the infection curve of COVID-19, we've decided to postpone public service today for a third week in a row. At this time, I agree with our city leaders that the safer at home order is the responsible thing to do. However, and I'll be honest here, my heart's desire is to see the church gathered together in worship and in fellowship. But until then, I hope these audio and video messages will either encourage or convict you to draw nearer to God. I also ask that you join us in prayer for those who've been affected directly or indirectly by the coronavirus. As of this morning, there are 106 El Pasoans who have tested positive for COVID-19. 26 are currently hospitalized and eight are in ICU. Pray that God will heal them and that he'll provide strength and comfort for them and their families during this difficult time. If you've tested positive and happen to be listening or watching this message and need prayer or just need some encouragement, you can contact me regardless of where you're at. If you're on a cruise liner or in New York or in Miami or in Europe, wherever it may be, you can contact me and we will, I will pray for you and I will try to encourage you with, uh, with God's word. Now, if you're here in town and find yourself in a hospital bed or in a waiting room, you can let me know as well. And I'll come by, yes, I'll be wearing my PPE, but I'll come by and sit with you and pray with you. You see, yes, although you may be infected, you're still loved by God and you're still valuable to him. During this difficult time, remind yourself of the words found in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other thing created will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, as many of you probably already know, today is Palm Sunday. It's a day in which Christians celebrate the Lord's triumphal entry into Jerusalem over 2,000 years ago. So as we continue our chapter by chapter study in Luke's gospel, I sincerely hope that by the time this message is over, that you'll allow Jesus to make a triumphal entry into your heart this morning or this afternoon or whatever day it is that you may be watching this message. So let's now begin with today's message. Well, a week ago, we looked at six matters Jesus wanted his disciples to consider regarding his return and the ministerial responsibility in which they were called. This week, we'll close out chapter 13 by reading about six features of Jesus' ministry. As a believer, you'll see that these features are important to know and understand and how you can apply them into your personal life and in the work God has called you to do. So before we get into the word, let's ask the Lord to speak to us. Heavenly Father, we come before you on another 
Sunday um, where the church isn't able to meet, Lord, um, isn't able to come together and, and worship you as a group, Lord, as a fellowship of believers. Lord, um, I pray for every single one of them, Lord, all those that um, have called Fresh Vision Church their home. I pray for them, their families, for their safety, for their health, Lord, during this uh, pandemic that we're going through right now, Lord. And I also pray for those who um, are sick. I pray that you will heal them and comfort, comfort them, Lord, you know, during this difficult time, Lord. Some of them are suffering really bad. Some of them are, are uh, going through just extreme anguish because they just don't know what to expect. Lord, I pray that you will reveal yourself to them, give them the answers that they're looking for, Lord. Um, surround them with people that will, in, that will encourage them, Lord but ultimately show them your grace, your mercy, your beauty, Heavenly Father. So right now, as we get into the study, I pray that you will bless it, Lord, that you will speak to those who are listening and watching. Lord, um, may they have ears to hear and eyes to see, Lord, what you're trying to teach them what you want to teach them, Lord. So again, soften hearts, soften minds right now, Lord. Use me as your vessel to speak your truth, Lord, and, and just empty me of, of any pride, any ego, any, anything that will get in the way of, of just using me, Lord, of you using me. So again, bless this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, verse 10. Luke chapter 13, verse 10. As, as he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, a woman was there who had been disabled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not straighten up at all. When Jesus saw her, he called out to her, Woman, woman, you are free from your disability. Then he laid his hands on her, and instantly she was restored and began to glorify God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, responded by telling the crowd, There are six days when work should be done. Therefore, come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, Hypocrites, doesn't each one of you untie his ox or donkey from the feeding trough on the Sabbath and lead it to water? Satan has bound this woman, his woman, a daughter of Abraham, for 18 years. Shouldn't she be untied from this bondage on the Sabbath day? <laughs> when he had said these things, all his adversaries were humiliated, but the whole crowd was rejoicing over all the glorious things he was doing. He said, therefore, what is the kingdom of God like? And what can I compare it to? It's like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden. It grew and it became a tree and the birds of the sky nested on his branches. Again, he said, what can I compare the kingdom of God to? It's like leaven that a woman took and mixed into 50 pounds of flour until all of it until all of it was leavened. The first three features of Jesus' ministry are seen here in this portion of Scripture. The first one is found in this amazing story of restoration where Jesus showed compassion by healing a woman on the Sabbath. Now, throughout this gospel, we've already seen several instances of Jesus displaying compassion to people who were in desperate need of it. Here, Dr. Luke tells us about another instance where our Lord again displayed compassion while teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Among the worshipers there was a handicapped woman who for 18 years had been bent over and was completely unable to straighten up. 
Now typically her condition would have probably been seen as some kind of spinal deformity or something similar to that. But in all reality, something else was the source of her condition. It says in verse 11 that a spirit was the cause of her disability. So always keen of people's spiritual condition, Jesus saw her, called out to her, and took the initiative to heal her. This time, however, instead of verbally commanding the spirit to depart, he laid his hands on her. And upon doing so, she was instantly restored and was able to straighten her back again. And at that moment when she did that, the woman recognized the source of her healing and began to glorify God. Now, if you're currently in ministry or have a desire to be in ministry, our Savior here shows us what compassionate ministry looks like. Now, although on this particular Sabbath, he began ministering by teaching scripture, he ended up ministering in other ways as well. He ministered by being aware of his listeners' spiritual needs. He ministered by showing compassion for a woman he didn't know. He ministered by seeing a woman's need and then doing something about it. Now, there are many who think that ministry is all about teaching the Bible. But as our Savior here shows us, the work of the ministry involves more than just that. Ministry is making the effort to be aware of others' spiritual needs, of those that you're serving. See, anyone willing to serve will find a way to, to do that, to help out. But there are only a few who will sit, listen, and pray for someone who's in a spiritual crisis. Ministry involves having sympathy for the lost and broken, regardless of who they are, what they look like, or where they come from. Samuel Chadwick once said, compassion costs. It's easy enough, for, it's easy enough to argue, criticize, and condemn. But redemption is costly and comfort draws from the deep. Brains can argue, but it takes heart to comfort. Also, ministry is seeing a need and acting upon it without hesitation. So whether it's helping out here at the church, at this church, or at the church that you're currently attending, or even if it's helping others when you're out and about, look for ways to use the gift God has given you to meet at need. If you see someone hurting, if you see someone crying, if you see someone that isn't acting normally, you, they're just not acting like they normally do, approach them. See what's going on, don't just walk away. Maybe they're going through something that you may not know about. They're just really struggling with, with an issue, with a sin maybe. Don't be afraid, don't be shy, don't hesitate to meet that brother or sister's need by praying for them. Or maybe someone hasn't had something to eat for a few days. Well, there's ways you can meet their need as well. Or maybe someone is just scared, really fearful about this coronavirus. They're wondering if they have it or a coworker has it and they're gonna contract it and, and they're just anxious and nervous and scared. Well, go up to that brother or sister or call them, reach out to them and comfort them. Find, find words from here in scripture where you can comfort them, where you can tell them that it's going to be okay. God is in control, and He has them 
in, in the palm of his hand. Again, if you see a need, don't hesitate to meet it. Now, there's one other point I'd like to mention here. It's the importance of being in fellowship with others. For 18 long years, the work of the enemy bound this woman physically. Nonetheless, she's there. She was there in the synagogue. She would have missed the moment of, the, of, of that miraculous, she would have missed the moment of that miracle had she stayed home the day Jesus just happened to, to walk in. Now, there were many times, there have been many times in my own walk with the Lord where I just didn't want to go to a, a Bible study or I didn't want to go to church. I just would rather just stay home and sleep in or, or maybe watch something on TV or, I don't know, do something else. But I went anyways. And let me tell you, every time I did, I found Jesus ministering, ministering to me in, in a way that he wouldn't have had I stayed home. Therefore, I have learned this secret. The more I don't feel like meeting with the congregation or being here at church or, or going to a Bible study or, or going to a men's group, men's fellowship, the more I need to be there. I'm convinced that people walk around needlessly crippled because they're not in a company of believers, not in the place where Jesus is. The second feature of Jesus' ministry was the way in which he dealt with opposition by facing down his critics. We're told in verse 14, then rather than, rather than praising God for the miracle that he had just witnessed, the leader of the synagogue became indignant. He became angry. He, he, he felt... He was, he was offended. He felt angry and offended because the Lord had healed on the Sabbath. Now, this is what I imagine him saying to Jesus. How dare you break our law? You know we can't work on the Sabbath. And all of us rabbis have long established that healing is work. And then he after that, he then responded, turned over to the crowd, turned to the crowd and responded by essentially telling them, quit bringing people here on the Sabbath to be healed. You have six other days to do that. But here's the thing. Even if they had come any other day of the week, he couldn't have done anything for them. He didn't have the power the healing power, the miraculous powers that Jesus had. So it wouldn't have mattered if they, w if, if they would have been brought on any other day. Furthermore, had Jesus been there on a non-Sabbath day, the rabbi probably would have found another legal argument why he shouldn't be healing on, on that particular moment or that particular day. See, as a professional religionist with no deep concern for the problems of the people, he clearly showed he didn't have mercy and love in his heart. Sadly, this religious leader missed the entire point of what God's work is. Now, instead of getting mad and storming out of the synagogue saying, you know, that's it, I've had enough, forget this. The Lord used this moment as a teaching opportunity to reprove the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. He reminded them, reminded them that neither of them hesitated to untie his donkey from the feeding trough on the Sabbath in order to let it drink, which, by the way, he knew would have been defined as work according to the religious rules of the Sabbath. Well then, 
if they showed such consideration for a dumb animal on the Sabbath? Was it wrong for Jesus to free this woman that Satan had bound? Now, by also calling her a daughter of Abraham, he was also indicating not only that she was Jewish, but she was a true believer, a woman of faith. He again reminded them that for 18 long years, she suffered under the bondage of Satan, and he set her free because of his compassion. Spurgeon noted, nobody had told him that she had been 18 years bound, but he knew all about it, how she came to be bound, what she had suffered during the time. Now she had prayed for healing, how she had prayed for healing and how the infirmity still pressed upon her. In one minute, he had read her history and understood her case. The point our Savior was making, our, the point our Savior was making was this. Do I not have as much right to untie her from the affliction she has suffered for 18 years? Is she less important than your animals? What's interesting about this entire interaction was that although Jesus had freed a woman who was physically bound, he could have also freed that Pharisee, that religious leader. But because of their rules and regulation regarding the Sabbath, this religious leader would remain bound in false piety and hypocrisy. Now, after saying this, hushed silence fell over the crowd. The adversaries of our Lord were thoroughly humiliated by his words. And then praise and joy broke out. The crowd recognized all the glorious things he was doing for the people, especially those who felt that they didn't have anyone to stick up for them, anyone to stick up for them against the religious leaders or the religious political system. They were happy to finally see someone not only standing up to the system, but also seeing someone who cared for and helped the little people of society. The fact that they recognized it as glorious indicates they knew the acts of Jesus, that the acts Jesus was performing came from a divine origin. Ladies and gentlemen, we follow a radical leader, one who is liberating, one who is unique, and one who is wonderful. The third feature of Jesus' ministry was how he provided instruction through two parables that revealed the nature of the kingdom. In the first story, Jesus likened the kingdom of God to a mustard seed, one of the tiniest seeds. Now, this seed was probably, probably a Sinapis nigra, or black mustard seed, which will normally grow into a four foot high shrub. However, when placed in the right soil and in the right climate, it may reach as high as nine feet tall. So when Jesus said that this seed grew and became a tree, he may have been indicating its growth, that its growth would have been greater. It would have been probably more massive than just that nine foot nine foot shrub or nine foot tree if so its branches would have been strong enough to support the various birds of the sky who nested on its branches the thought here is that christianity had had a humble beginning small as a grain of a mustard seed but as it grew it became popularized and Christendom, as we know it today, developed. Now quickly, just as a side note, Christendom, for those who may not know, Christendom is composed of all who profess allegiance to Jesus, whether they're born again or not. 
Additionally, a close study of birds as symbols in the, in the Old Testament will reveal that they're often symbols of evil, of demons, and of even Satan. So, if you take all that under consideration, this parable accurately describes what kingdom community became in the, decade, in the decades and centuries after the Christianization of the Roman Empire. In those centuries, the church grew abnormally large in influence and, in, and dominion. It was a nest for much corruption. And even now, to this day, this can be seen. All you have to do is watch religious TV or hear uh, a wacky podcast on the internet to see that this is so. For there are indeed some strange birds roosting in the name of the kingdom of God. Thus, as G. Campbell Morgan puts it, birds lodging on the branches most probably refers to the elements of corruption which take, which take refuge in the very shadow of Christianity. The second parable reinforces the first with the implication that the kingdom of God would eventually permeate the entire earth, much like leaven can spread in even, through even 50 pounds of flour. Now, while it's true that leaven often symbolizes evil in the this passage is a clear exception. Here, leaven is used positively and calls to mind the potency of Jesus' message and works on behalf of humanity. When started, the kingdom will grow and expand by virtue of its own contents. The idea here is that you can no more stop kingdom growth than you can keep yeast from making dough rise and expand. In Christ, the kingdom has come near where people can see it. But the kingdom is still so small, it isn't obvious. For that to occur, one must, must have ears to hear and eyes to see. A person must listen to the word of the kingdom and begin practicing it as well. Soon, this almost invisible nucleus will expand into the grand structure no one will be able to miss, a structure that will eventually determine salvation or eternal punishment for the entire world. Now, before I move on to the next three features of Jesus' ministry, I want to quickly go over these, these first three features that we just looked at and how we can apply them ourselves. Just as Jesus ministered with compassion, we ought to have the same heart as we serve each other and our neighbors. Ephesians 4.32 says, And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Secondly, Jesus, just as Jesus dealt with opposition by standing up to his critics, we should always be ready to defend the faith we live by and are willing to die for. We're encouraged in 1 Peter 3.15 to be ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and respect. The third feature that we saw was just as Jesus ministered by providing instruction to reveal the kingdom of God, we should never grow tired of testifying about the kingdom, about that kingdom that is to come. Like Paul, when he was under house arrest in Rome, Acts 28, 31 says that he kept proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. The next three features of Jesus' ministry is seen in the last portion of this chapter. So let's find out what they are by picking up in verse 22. Luke chapter 13, verse 22. He went through one town and village after another, 
teaching and, make, and making his way to Jerusalem. Lord, someone asked, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the never door, because I tell you, many will try to enter and won't be able. One, Luke chapter 13, verse 22. He went through one town and village after another, teaching and making his way to Jerusalem. Lord, someone asked, someone asked him, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make, he said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Because I tell you, many will try to enter and won't be able once the old homeowner gets up and shuts the door. Then you will stand outside and knock on the door saying, Lord, open up for us. He will answer you, I don't know you or where you're from. Then you will say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I don't know you or where you're from. Get away from me, me, from me all you evildoers. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth in that place. When you see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves will be thrown out. But you yourselves, but you yourselves thrown out. They will come from east and west, from north and south, to share the banquet in the kingdom of God. Note this, some who are last will be first, and some who are first will be last. At that time, some Pharisees came and told him, Go, get out of here. Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go tell that fox, Look, I'm driving out demons and performing healings today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will complete my work. Yet it is necessary that I travel today, tomorrow, and the next day, because it's not possible for a prophet to perish outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you are not willing. See, your house has abandoned you. I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. As Jesus continues to make his way to Jerusalem, these final paragraphs of chapter 13 reveal three additional features of Jesus' ministry. In verses 22 through 30, he gave a strong admonition to enter through the narrow door. That is, come into a relationship with God through faith and trust in Him alone. Going through one town and village after another, Luke 4.43 tells us our Lord had one purpose in mind, to proclaim the good news about the kingdom of God. While doing so, a voice in the crowd wanted to know, are only a few going to be saved? The question was simple, and it wasn't intended to provoke an argument. Well, the Lord answered this speculative question with a direct command. He told the questioner to make every effort to enter, to enter through the narrow door. By saying this, he didn't mean that salvation requires effort on our part. No, the narrow door that he's speaking of here is the new birth, salvation by grace through faith. Thus, Jesus was warning the man to make sure that he himself entered by this door. He then adds, many will try to enter and won't be able once this door is shut. Again, just to clarify, this doesn't mean that they will seek to enter by the door of conversion, but rather when Christ returns in power and glory. They'll want admission to his kingdom, but it'll be too late. The day of grace in which we live in right now will have come to an end. The Lord goes on to explain that on that day, it'll be as if the homeowner gets up and shuts the door. The Jewish nation is then pictured as knocking on the door and asking the Lord to open up. He'll refuse on the ground that he doesn't know them 
or where they're from. They will protest at this point, pretending that they lived on intimate terms with him, but he won't be moved. He won't be moved by their false claims of authenticity. He will yell from the other side to get away from him, call them evildoers, and will not allow them to come in. This doesn't just apply to the Jewish nation. It applies to every person who didn't open up their lives to him while they had the opportunity to. So just as they closed the door on him, he won't open the door to his kingdom. Now some will say that this is wrong and that there's no way that a loving God will refuse anyone from entering into his kingdom. <clears throat> Well, for those who believe this, let me remind you of another time in the Bible where a door was shut on unbelievers. For 100 years, Noah told the people that they had better turn around and change directions because a flood was coming. But they never took the warning serious until the rain began to fall. Then they wanted in. But because it was the Lord who shut the door, Noah couldn't open it to let a few more people inside. And in this, the Lord shows us that there comes a day when a door is shut and one's decision is sealed eternally. So don't let that be you. Don't let that, don't be that person that is found outside the door asking the Lord, Lord, let me in. I came to church, I worshiped, I raised my hands. I once in a while opened up the Bible and read and I occasionally prayed. Don't be that person. The Lord will call out and say, who are you? I don't even know you. Open the door to your heart to him today. Believe in him. Trust in him. Accept him as your Lord and Savior. And once he comes in, he promises to give you new life. He promises, he says that you will be born again. And as a born again believer, he will accept you into his kingdom. And you won't be found on the outside where, again, he will tell you, get out, I never knew you. He will say, welcome, my son. Welcome, my child. Welcome to your new home. Well, we learn in verse 28 that those who find themselves on the outside of his eternal kingdom will be weeping, and, and th there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here, weeping indicates remorse. And the gnashing of teeth speaks of violent pain and hatred of God that they'll experience in hell. This shows that even as they're suffering in hell, their hearts won't change. And can you imagine that? Being in a place where you are eternally separated from God. At this moment, even though people aren't believers, they still ex experience a portion of His grace a portion of his mercy. They can still experience what it's like to be blessed. But once they're in hell, God, they will be eternally separated from God. They will no longer experience or feel the joy, the love, the mercy of God. All they will feel is remorse, hatred, pain. Imagine a pain so extreme that you're just gnashing your teeth. I don't know, it's not anything at all that I ever want to experience. And I hope that you don't either. Unbelieving Israelites will see Abraham, Abraham Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. When they see them, 
they're going to expect to get a free pass into the kingdom simply because they were related to them. But Jesus informs them that they'll be thrown out. Gentiles, however, will come from all corners of the earth to share the banquet in the kingdom of God and enjoy its wonderful blessings. Thus, many Jews who were first in God's plans for blessing will be rejected, while the Gentiles who were looked down upon as dogs will enjoy the blessings of Christ's millennial reign. Another feature this passage shows us about Jesus' ministry was how he showed resolution to press on to Jerusalem to fulfill his mission. Luke says that at that time, some Pharisees came to the Lord and warned him to get out because Herod wanted to kill him. This shows that not all the Pharisees opposed Jesus. There, was, there were a special group who respected him and wanted to protect him from the murderous plots of Herod. Now, a person that comes to mind is Nicodemus. He probably was part of this group. Now, there were probably others as well that was just looking out for him, that respected him, that may have even actually believed in him. But they had to stay low profile. They had to stay low key if they wanted to keep the positions that they were in. Now, although he did end up leaving, it wasn't because he was scared of Herod, but because he was following a divine timetable. He knew that as long as he was doing the will of God, according to the Father's schedule, nothing could harm him. See, it had been decreed from eternity that the Son of God will be crucified in Jerusalem at the Passover. So if this was the will and plan of God, then not even Herod Antipas could hinder the purposes of God. When it comes to the purposes of, of God's purposes for your life, be assured that as long as you remain faithful and obedient to Him, He will carry it out until it's complete. Don't allow the warnings of men or death threats from those in power scare you into thwarting the mission God has given you. He also has you on a divine schedule. All you have to do is follow it one day at a time until he gives you the next mission or brings you home to be with him. Trust in the words God said in Isaiah 14, 24. As I have purposed, so it will be. As I have planned it, so it will happen. Remind yourself of the words Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Therefore, friends, just as Jesus showed resolution to move forward and fulfill his mission, may you be just as resolute to fulfill your mission, to fulfill the calling that God has given you. I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it out until completion, carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Unmoved by the threat of physical violence, Jesus responded by giving the Pharisees a message to relay back to Herod that pretty much said this, tell that old fox to stand by. I'm doing my normal work defeating the kingdom of Satan. In a few days, I'll be finished and then I'll deal with him. Until then, I will not alter my course for him, nor will I change my time schedule. You're not in control of me. My father is. I will complete his mission a mission that must end in Jerusalem, where prophets generally die. Now, when he was done giving them the message they were to pass on to Herod, the Lord turned his attention to the city that he just mentioned. 
and it's here where we see the sixth feature of his ministry. Jesus demonstrated his affection for the inhabitants of Jerusalem in his lamentation over the city. Looking towards the city, he grieved and wept over it. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, he tearfully cried out. The fact that he repeats it twice emphasizes the depth of his emotion for it. Now this could also be seen when he repeated the names of Martha in Luke chapter 10 verse 41 and Paul in Acts chapter 9 verse 4. The Lord goes on to say about the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers, how often he wanted to gather its citizens under his wings like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But sadly, unlike those baby chickens, the citizens of the city were not willing to come and instead scrambled away in all different directions. As a result, their city, their temple, and their land would be abandoned and would pass through a long period of exile. In fact, they would not see the Lord until they changed their attitude towards him. Knowing Socrates was innocent of the charge of corrupting the youth of Athens, it is said that his executioner wept as he handed him the hemlock. Here, however, the executioner doesn't weep for the condemned, the condemned weeps for the executioners. Truly, the world has never seen such love. What a picture. Jesus Christ, not because Jerusalem would reject them, but because they would not allow him to protect them. How about you? Have you allowed the Lord to do what he desires to do? to place his arm around you, to protect and to comfort you? It's not our shortcomings or our failings that cause the Lord to weep. Rather, rather, it's our failure to allow him to love us that causes his tears to flow. All those times, all those moments that you said, no, I'd rather not accept you. I'd rather not let you in to my heart, or all those times you walked away from him. Those are the times that he weeps and he grieves. He grieves over you and says, oh, how I wish you would just come to me. I wish you would just come so that I can protect you, so, I can, so that I may watch over you, comfort you, so I may give you the life that you were, intent, that you were intended to live. Don't allow another day to go by where you walk away from him, where you reject him. Receive him today as your Lord and Savior. And he will gather you in under the shadow of his wing. And there's no other place where you'll find safety, comfort, and protection. The end of verse 35 refers to the second advent of Christ. When he returns, a remnant of the nation of Israel will repent and say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Then, at last, his people will willingly come under the protection of his wings and find comfort and safety there. Before I close, let me once again go over the six features of Jesus' ministry. Here are the first three features he exemplified in verses 10 through 21, Jesus showed compassion. Jesus dealt with opposition. Jesus provided instruction. In verses 22 to 35, our Lord exemplified these next three features of his ministry. Jesus gave strong admonition. Jesus showed resolution. Jesus demonstrated his affection. I believe that as born-again believers, we shouldn't just know about these features, but we should also apply them as well. Why? Because being a Christian isn't just a title. It's a way of life. Our goal 
is to be just like him. That's what God has predestined us to become. This process, though, demands our willing cooperation with the Holy Spirit. Becoming more Christ-like requires both divine power and the fulfillment of human responsibility. Our passages this morning tell us, tells us what some of those responsibilities are. Showing compassion, dealing with opposition, providing instruction, admonishing, showing resolution, and demonstrating affection. If you are a born-again believer, at this very moment, God is working in you. We all, with unveiled faces, are looking as in, as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed, transformed into the same image from glory to glory. This is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. One day, however, as 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says, the process will be complete. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him as He is. The promise of being fully Christ-like in the future is in and of itself motivation for becoming more Christ-like now. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as he is pure. Brothers and sisters in Christ, whether you're in ministry or not, apply these features of Jesus' ministry into your life and take notice of how much you'll grow and be blessed. Show compassion. Deal with opposition. Provide instruction. Give strong admonition, show resolution, and demonstrate affection. Let's close with a word of prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, we come before you now and ask you to help us apply these features into our lives and into our ministry so that we can become more like your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that this life is full of struggles, full of heartaches, full of pain, full of diseases, viruses, Lord. We have told us that if we overcome, if we endure, if we remain faithful to the end, that you will welcome us into your kingdom. But in, until then, Lord, you have also told us that you are transforming us into the image of Christ. So continue to do that, Lord. Remind us every day of who we're becoming, Lord. Not who we were, but who we're becoming. May we live our lives according to the plan that you have for us, Lord. May we not be distracted by the life's, all of life's worries and concerns and may our focus be completely on you. Help us to have compassion. Help us to have mercy. Help us to, to again, demonstrate these qualities that these characteristics, these features that Jesus exemplified in his ministry. And we ask you now that you forgive us for falling short. Thank you for accepting me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for making me your child. Now, if there's anyone out there who's listening and watching who hasn't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you're ready to open the door to your heart to Jesus Christ, allow me to lead you in a prayer to receive Jesus and become born again. So wherever you're at, close your eyes, bow your head, and pray this with all your heart, with all sincerity. Lord God, I admit that I'm a sinner. 
And I ask you now that you forgive me. I believe that you sent your son to die on the cross for my sin, for my sins. And I confess him now as Lord and Savior. I believe that the blood that he shed was for the forgiveness of my sins. Lord, thank you for forgiving me. And thank you for making me born again. I ask you that you fill me with your Holy Spirit so that I may know you more, so that I may fall in love with you more. Lord, from now on, my life is completely dedicated to you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that, let us know. Contact us. We want to hear from you. We want to encourage you. And we want to help lead you into your next steps as a Christian. We can help you find a church. We can help you find a Bible study. And if you're here in El Paso, we want to invite you to come join us here. I know right now, because of this whole coronavirus mess, we aren't able to open up our doors, but we will soon. And we want to invite you to come and join us. Again, if you want to know more about us, if you want to contact us, if you want to reach out to us, whatever it may be, if you need prayer, you can just go to our website at fvcelp.org and we will we will get back to you I sincerely want to thank all of you who took the time to watch and hear this message may God bless you this entire week may he show you his beauty his glory and may he shower you with his blessings God bless you and we'll see you next week